In Brother Matthew's text, the Lord is calling Israel to remember something that will cause them to come to this conclusion, that he is God and there is none else. To remember what work was done in the earth to call them out from among the nations as a people of his own. <clears throat> to introduce this topic today, I just wanted to rehearse some of the former things and apply it to our own calling out from among the world. One of the primary things that the Lord is constantly calling to Israel's attention is this deliverance from Egypt that he worked when he brought them out and spoiled the nation that was once a place of slavery to them. <clears throat> if it were not for God being God, the circumstance of this people in the land would have been much different. Yeah. He called them out, he caused the time to be right, and he delivered them safely out of Egypt onto the other side of the Red Sea, miraculously. Likewise, we were brought out from a similar place, a place of heavy, heavy bondage and burden. We too were liberated from a slavery of the soul and from an enemy with, with, um, that was more powerful than us. In both cases, it was a thing that only God could do. Also, after having brought this people out of Egypt, he brought them into a land of their own, a land full of benefits and riches required for them to abound in, um, in life and prosper. It was inhabited by some nations who had mighty strongholds that, were in, that seemed impenetrable. But as they experienced in the incident in Je with Jericho, God delivered their enemies, which would other otherwise frustrate and overcome them. He delivered them right into their hands. Yeah. <clears throat> Likewise, we have been freed from the bondage of sin, and we have been led into a place where there is much benefit and plenty available. We too have experienced great victory over some of the opposition of the enemy to obtain part of the substance which is made available. These things happen because God is God. There is no other that could have done these things. When we think back upon the work that, that has been done to bring us to the place where we are now, we with Israel in our text ought to come to this conclusion. He is God and there is none else. Yes. Amen. Thank you. Now Brother Matt will come. Remember the former things of old, for I am God. Uh, God is calling Israel to, to remember the reason for their very existence. You would not be a nation if it was not for me. This is the thing that they had forgotten that caused them to be delivered into this captivity in the first place. Um, I, I just wanted to go through and rehearse a few things here. These are things that, that God did that only God could do that um, it just makes it ap apparent, especially to the nation of Israel at the time, that I am God and there is none else. Now, when we're talking about the calling of the patriarch Abraham, Abraham didn't ask for God to reveal himself to him. God called out Abraham. He did that. God didn't ask, or Abraham didn't ask God for a promise. He gave him the promise. He promised him a blessing, and he told him what he was going to do with him. He did not um, give him this promise according to what Abraham desired, but according to his own purpose and will. And when he opened up Sarah's womb, he, and when he made a child within her, when they were past childbearing years, he, he directed the ways in which the heirs would be reckoned. So he, he, as it went down, he, if it hadn't have been for the direction of God, remember, uh, Isaac, he would have blessed Esau. That was his intention. But before it was all over with, he saw what, what, what God was doing. He was directing this. He orchestrated the circumstances in which he called his people into Egypt through Joseph. What man could have planned that? What man could have, well, we're going to sell him into slavery and he'll, it, while he's in prison, he'll, he'll interpret this dream and he'll, he'll bring us into Egypt. No man would do that. This is, this is God. Amen. I mean, who would, who would even begin to be able to know that there would be a famine? So, so this, this was God. And when the time came that he called them out from this nation who put them in bondage while they were in Egypt, he worked many signs and wonders in the sight of all of them. Even their magicians, they had to admit, this is beyond us. And, and 
above and beyond that, how could you explain the Israelites being left out of all of these things? It was a, it was a regional plague over and over and over again. He's saying, I am God. He's exalting himself above. It's, simultaneously, he's doing, he's doing two things at the same time. He's calling out the nation of Israel, and he's judging the gods of the Egyptians. I am, I am God. Who else is equal to these things? Who, who just creates a pillar of fire between him and his enemies? Who, who parts a sea to where you can just walk through it on dry ground? He's, he's, he's telling them, remember these things. Remember what I did. Remember the former things of old. I am God. Amen. I separated you out from all the other nations of the world to make you a peculiar people. I gave you a law unlike any other nation. Do you remember that? Do you remember when I came down on the mountain in fire and smoke and I, I revealed myself to my servant Moses and, and showed him my glory? Remember those things. Remember when I protected you supernaturally from your enemies while you, while you were um, subduing the nations, getting this land for your own possession. Amen. And this is how he says it in the 44th chapter of Isaiah. Thus saith the Lord, the King of Israel and his Redeemer, the Lord of hosts, I am the first and the last, and beside me there is no God. And who as I shall call and shall declare it and set in order for me since I appointed the ancient people and the things that are coming and shall come, let them show unto them. Fear ye not, neither be afraid, for have not I told thee from that time and declared it? Hearken unto me, O house of Jacob and all the remnant of the house of Israel, which are born by me from the belly and which are carried from the womb. He's, he's, telling, he's telling them this. I made you. I delivered you. Now, th this is the context in which he delivers this word, this word to them. Remember the former things of old. How, how can you possibly give yourself to idols when you remember this? Idols of your own fashioning. So, uh, I was thinking about this as I was preparing it. This morning, as we, as we look at this text, we're not just remembering something that God told Israel in antiquity. This is, this is something that's very pertinent to us as well. As we look back through the, the scriptural account, we, we, we remember the former things. We come to this same conclusion that He is God and that there is none else. Especially relevant for us, or relevant for us now um, is what has happened to us in Christ. This has an application to um, a connection here to our life in Christ. Just surely as God worked mightily on the behalf of Israel, he, He's worked mightily through His Son Christ on our behalf. So remember those former things. Remember what God did in Christ. We didn't ask to, for Christ to come to us. God, God did that. There's, there's former things that we have in this testimony concerning the formation of our very citizenship with the saints. Even on an individual basis, who is it that called you? Were you seeking the Lord or did He find you? Who was it that ordained from the foundation of the world according to the election of grace to bring you out of darkness and into His marvelous light? It was God. He's the one that did that. Why exactly is it that your sins are forgiven? Because God in His own purpose and will sent His Son to die for you. That's why it happened. Why can you come to the throne and have grace to help in time of need? Because of God. Because of what He did in His Son. But if, if you ever find yourself in anything wavering, bring this again to mind. Rehearse the former things. All, everything that God has done up until this point to bring you where you are. Just as Israel was, you are born by Him from the belly. Amen. You will find that your birth in Christ was necessitated by the call and the purpose of God. Yes. Amen. E even on an individual basis, He sent forth His Spirit and He sent every one of us a messenger to preach this message unto us. I mean, there, there is a certain sense in which although your heart and mind and will were involved in the purpose, from a higher perspective, salvation is of the Lord. It was a work of God. Amen. Amen. This is the way that he said it in 1 Corinthians. But of him, that is God, are ye in Christ Jesus. Amen. So he tells them, for I am God. 
I am God. Uh, this is something that is a, a foreign thought to many in our day, what it exactly means for God to be a God. And in the, the last two chapters um, before our text, he says this in a variety of ways. He, he expounds his work that he has performed in his dealings with Israel. And I wanted to focus upon these few key phrases. These, these are things that only God can say about himself, really. He says, I will. He says, I form. I make. I have created it. I have done it. I have sworn by myself. And, and, and this is going to serve um, uh, as our definition of what it means for God to be God today. This first one, I will. Now this is at the heart of the, uh, what we've been speaking about this, um, this table in the wilderness. God is the only one who's able to determine a purpose that cannot and will not be frustrated or prevented from coming to pass. Amen. He's the only one, as it says in our text, that Brother Ricky very ably um, preached to us to declare the end from the beginning. He's the only one who can do this. And this is what those who are in Israel failed to remember. That, that this promise of God, at some point in time, they began to believe that there was more benefit in putting their trust in these idols than in the living God. They failed to trust that God was true and he was faithful to bless them if they were obedient to his laws. He said it. He told them, I will. I will bless you. So the, the promises that God has made in Christ Jesus, we, we can see that, that in this as well. That the Lord has not lost sight of the things that he has promised, regardless of how much time goes by, regardless of how much circumstance may seem to contradict it. God is God. What he said will come to pass. He says, I will. It's, it's going to happen. He will do all of his pleasure. And when we thank the Lord today that it has been revealed that it is the, His good pleasure to give you the kingdom. This, this ought to give you confidence. So then he says, I form, I make, I have created it. Now whatever can be said about the capacity of man to make anything, when it's all said and done, really all men are doing is rearranging the things that have already been created. Even in the secular scientific term, matter, you know, they will admit you can't make matter out of nothing. Matter doesn't just, it doesn't just come out of anything man is able to do. Only God can create something out of nothing. He is the only creator, the maker. And as a result of this, uh, since all things find their genesis in him, all things continue by virtue of his existence. The earth and mankind are, as some have supposed, just some kind of machine that God has made to operate independent of him. Of him. And the, 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 Brother Aaron um, just spoke about this. It was, was very clear about it. God didn't make the earth and the, the seasons and the times as like some kind of program that just works out itself. We're seeing God upholding all things by the word of his power. The, these things are faithful because God is faithful, because he is the creator. He is God. And lastly, I have sworn by myself. Now, in the court of law, there's no man who is able to use this as his defense. Now, we, uh, we are, as men have become accustomed to the fact that we are not immutable. We are not constant. We are not unchanging. Men very oftentimes can lie. They are not honest. And as a result of this, in court, there always has to be a witness. There's got to be someone else there who can corroborate their testimony. Nobody can stand before their fellow man and say, I swear by myself, and that's the end of all the controversy. But with God, this, this is true. The very constancy of God's nature itself is the end of all argument. He said, is there a God beside me? Yea, there is no God. I know not any. So in summary, he's, he's the creator. He's the one in whom all things find their being. The one who existed before all things and will ever exist. The one who does not change. The one who does what he will, when he will, regardless of what anyone may think or do. I am God. Now the truth of who God is is one which has been for many throughout history an inconvenient one. Now, the, the worship of idols may seem to, to some people who are ignorant in some way kind of honorable. 
And they may think, well, at least they're acknowledging that there's something greater than themselves, you know. They may not know what it is, but at least in that, they're humble. But, but really, the creation of an idol is prideful. It, it is man deciding what they will fear. It's man deciding what they will honor and what they will worship. And the reason why men of old in the ancient world created gods of their own to worship is the same reason why men in our time fill up their hearts and their minds with pleasures and the things that they like and the things that they want to consider. It's, it's an escape. It's trying to find an escape from the reality that God is God. They are attempting, as it were, to make themselves God, to, to refuse to submit themselves to any kind of authority, anything that would, would hold them down or tell them what to do or what to think or how to feel. They're saying, we're not going to let this man rule over us, but that doesn't change the fact that God is God. Amen. And now we, we have kind of a trend in our day of, of um, people being agnostic. They, they say, well, I don't have a problem with the idea of a God, and I believe there's some kind of higher power out there, but I don't know what it is. But you can tell by the way they live their life, they really don't believe there's any God at all. The only difference between them and an atheist is the atheist actually says with his mouth what the other person's life says. And, all, and although the idea in contemporary culture of literal images of of idols, God that we bow down to, may seem ridiculous to some people. The spirit of this is very much alive in our day. Men make gods unto themselves. Some men bow before the God of entertainment. Some men actually bow before the God of, of athleticism and sports. And so, Some people bow down before the God of, of intellectual pursuits. Or some bow before a God of science and technology and all the things that men can learn and do for themselves. And, and, and most subtly, some men have actually made religious activity their God. Now, in, in the wilderness, whenever Israel was given that brazen serpent to, to be lifted up to be the... the um, it was placed on that pole and lifted up so that all who would see it would live. And they, yeah. they, they would be healed from these, this um, bite of the serpent. But eventually, they actually ended up making that servant, serpent an idol. They actually worshipped the, the, the physical brazen serpent. And I don't know that this is a popular thing to say, but there are many in our days who idolize a brazen cross, so to speak. Yeah. They've actually taken the testimony of the very one who is lifted up so that he may draw all men to himself, and they have made him in their own image. That They've made the laughing Jesus, or the, the, the Jesus who would never say anything unpleasant or hard to anyone, and they'd, he just loves everybody into heaven. So, so the, the, there's a variety of, of ways in which this manifests itself, but it's, it's all the same thing. It's all, a, it's all a rebellion and a denial against the, the Godhood of God, if I could say it that way. So he, he goes on to say, I am God and there is none else. He says later, or I think this is earlier in this chapter, yes. To whom you will ye liken me and make me equal and compare me that we may be like. And he, he goes to talk about this idol here. They lavish gold out of the bag and, and they weigh silver in the balance and I hire a goldsmith and, and he makes it a god and they fall down and they worship and they, they bear him up on their shoulder and carry him and set him in his place. <laughs> so he, he, he's calling the, the people to look at him side to side with these gods that they have created for themselves. Can, can these gods really deliver you out of your trouble? Could these gods stop me from delivering your enemy, you into your enemy's hands in the first place? When you gave yourself over to these gods, on the day when the nation was taken, when Nebuchadnezzar was on the doorstep of Jerusalem, where were your gods on that day? In our text, Israel is, is going to learn a twofold lesson. Presently, they are being called to recall the failing of their own false gods in the time whenever they were delivered into captivity. And God is, is, is talking about a time when he's going to demonstrate in their liberation from their very captors the, the, the Babylonians' gods' inability to deliver them. Uh, uh, Brother Ricky made reference to this as well. I, I like at the beginning of this chapter, Bel and Nebo, the great gods of the Babylonians, they couldn't even give the animals that carted them off the strength to carry them. I mean, how powerless can you possibly get? 
And at this coming time, this occupation by Cyrus, he's going to demonstrate that even, you know, the Medes and the Persians, which I'm sure they had their own multitude of false deities, that they, even they are subject to the will and purpose of God. It's that Cyrus was, was the Lord lifting up to hit him up to do his pleasure, to, to do what he wanted to do. So he says, to who will you compare me? Now, now you... I, um, I could just imagine God saying to them, now your idols, they must be carried and put into place. Did you carry me? Did you put me in my place? No, actually I carried you. I put you in your place. You're only in this land because I put you there. I, I delivered you. And, and your idols, they are formed from things out of the earth. They're made of, of elements. I created the earth. The very element that you have made your God out of was created by me. And, and, and your idols, they're shaped by the hands of men. Men make the idols, whatever, you know, however they, they see fit. Did you create me? Did you shape me by your hand? No, I created you. I shaped you. I formed you from out of the dust of the earth with my own hands. Now, I, I, I love the mocking of these false gods. I, I appreciate what Brother Ricky said. And firstly, uh, this occasion of the ark and Dagon. Now, first of all, I would think that when you came into your temple and you saw your god face down on the floor, that may stop and think for a minute about the power of your god. Yeah. You know, I, could, I could just imagine um, Elijah being there. Well, perhaps your god was tired. Maybe he, he decided to take a rest on the floor, you know. But nevertheless, they, they picked him back up and they put him back in its place. And, and the, he arose early on the morrow morning. Behold, he was fallen on his face before the, the ark of the Lord and his heads and his, his hands were cut off. And the stump of Dagon was the only thing that was left to him. So he was reduced to what he actually was all along, a stump. And it kind of reminded me in the 44th chapter of Isaiah, he talks about this. He speaks about the man who has the cedar log, right? And, and, and with part of it, he makes firewood and he warms himself and he, he cooks his food on the rest. And then the, the, the last part of it, he makes a god. Now, I find it interesting the word they use in this text here. They call it, the, they said that they make a god out of the residue. Now, that doesn't even sound good to me. That sounds like the filth that's on the bathtub when you get done taking a bath, you know? The residue. It's just like, you'd think that he would make his God first and then burn the leftovers. But no, his God is the leftovers. So how does that, how does that make any sense? He says, And none considereth in his heart, neither is there any knowledge nor understanding to say, I burned part of it in the fire. Yeah, I've also baked bread upon the coals thereof. And eaten it, shall I make the residue thereof an abomination? Shall I fall down to the stock of a tree? Yeah. See, the same thing there is that Dagon, a stump. Now, what is a stump? A stump is dead wood, right? A stump is a tree that does not grow. A stump is a tree that does not produce fruit. It's not even good for shade. It's good for nothing. It is unprofitable. In Habakkuk, he says this, Woe unto them that saith to the wood, Awake! Or to the dumb stone, Arise, it shall teach. Because it's laid over with gold and silver. There's not any breath in it at all. But, he gives a contrast here, But the Lord is in His holy temple. Now let all the earth keep silence before Him. And this is, this is actually something that's more contemporary than I think people would imagine. Our, our, our generation needs to hear this. In the time when men are, are met with some kind of dire calamity, you notice they always want to, there's always a little more sensitivity towards the Lord. But when men who spend their lives living however they wish find that everything is falling apart around them, um, they need to hear this word that the prophet gives in this very next chapter after our main text. He says, Thou art wearied in the multitude of thy counsels. Now let the astrologers and the stargazers and the monthly prognosticators stand up and save thee from these things that shall come upon thee. Now God has done this many times throughout history of the world where men have angered and provoked him. In the time of trouble, when they call upon his name, he will not hear them. He tells them, you go and you call upon the God that you have been trusting in and have him deliver you. 
our generation, it would probably sound something like this to the professed church. Let the counselors stand up in that day and let the musicians and the psychologists and the self-help gurus, let them stand up in that day and save you. Or, to, or to, the, to the world, he would probably say, but let Buddha rise up and help you. Just have Muhammad come and intercede on your behalf, you know. Have the Shintoists and the Wiccans and the New Age spiritualists make a loud cry to their God and let's see if he'll answer. Or to the wicked Gentiles, call your senator, you know. Write a letter to your senator and see what, that, see what he can do. Call the police. So see if you can find some kind of technology or human ingenuity to deliver you from this calamity. And then this is even concerning things on this earth. Can you, the, the circumstances that may befall us in the present, but what can be said of the end? Now, ultimately, one must project themselves to the end of the world and the day of judgment as it concerns what you have been giving yourself to in this life. On the day when the elements are melting with fervent heat and the earth is passing away, those who have made science their God, let, well, they just have to see what this, this how, how can they explain that? Well, brethren, it, um, I, I didn't mean to be silly in some of these things, but it, it's, it's good to be able to see how ridiculous this, this really actually is. It needs to be said how it, how it ought to be said. It's, it's ridiculous. Oh, brethren, in conclusion to these things, I, as we continue to look at this, this, this topic, the immutable nature of our God, I, I exhort you to exercise yourselves in this and what he said in the text, to recall the former things. Uh, we have a wealth of testimony of, of the faithfulness of God, of all the things that he has done on our behalf as he has worked out his good pleasure in the earth as it concerns humanity. So God is the one who controls all things to the working of, of, of what he wants to do. So make it your business to make it sure that you are a participant in it as um, uh, Moses and not as like Pharaoh, not for the worst. Amen. Thank you, brother. Amen.